So uh, those slides were actually j just left over from last time. I kind of went through them right at the end quickly. Uh, so now these are the slides I posted today. And, and you know, here's the actual e equation that we're talking about, the, the ratio uh, of the shear to normal uh, really, if it, so a lot of times we write it like this, right? So we say that if the shear stress is some coefficient times the normal stress, that if that's less than zero, then the fault will not slip. If it's equal to zero, it means the fault is slipping, and it really can't be greater than zero, right? If it's, if it's greater than zero, um, it, it would imply that there's like, we've lost contact. So there is one sort of subtlety is that if we have a pore pressure, right? So if, if we have a fault, if we have a fault, and I'm going to, you know, no fault is, no fault has a perfect zero gap seal. In fact, it's, it's the roughness on these faces that give rise to this coefficient. Right? So, did you guys cover? You, know, you probably covered friction in like statics or something. Right? I mean, this is just a simple friction model, Coulomb friction. Right? So, so it's the roughness on these faces that give rise to this friction, and the fact that these faces are somewhat rough means there's got to be some air in there or some space. Right? And of course, in a saturated porous media that space is going to find itself filled with fluid. Whatever the fluid is, it's in the rest of it. Right? Hydrocarbons, water, whatever. Okay? And so there's going to be some fluid in our fault. That fluid has a pore pressure. And if we increase the pore pressure, right? remember pore pressure acts normal to surfaces. So remember when we, when we sort of idealized our poor elastic body, we had a body that had pores in it, and the pore pressure acts normal to the surface of those pores. <coughs> right? Well, it's the same thing here. So if we look at this, on our fault, we have a pore pressure that's acting normal. to the faces of the wall, and therefore if I increase the pore pressure, I'm going to begin to open up that fault, or another way to say that is I'm going to be able, I'm going to reduce the normal stress, right? So this normal stress is due to the tectonic stresses or, and or, you know, the vertical stress, right? But I, I'm going to reduce this by the amount of pore pressure. And so in the face of pore pressure, then this equation becomes the resolved normal stress minus the pore pressure right, in the denominator. Okay. So if I increase the pore pressure towards the normal stress, eventually I'll exceed this value and the fault will slip. So what is that value of mu? Right. It's the coefficient of friction, or I guess specifically the coefficient of static friction. Well, here's a whole bunch of data compiled from all different types of rocks. Right, so it may be hard to read, but that's uh, you know limestone, s sandstone, granite, lots of lots of different types of rocks. And in that case, so these, these were um, you know, actual friction experiments done on these rocks. So basically, two rocks were put together, uh, and, and then the various, um, you know, essentially the, the stress on the, uh, on the face was, was uh, controlled in some way, uh, such that uh, the normal shear stresses were controlled. And then they 
look for to see when the fault slips. Well, at the instant that it slips, right? If you plot that point, normal stress versus you know the shear stress is a function of normal stress. At the instant the the rock slips, the fault slips. Then you plot these dots, and this is the collection from all these different types of rocks. And you see that essentially in no case does it ever occur below 0.6. Right, so essentially, the value is almost always in the, the value is almost always from 0.6 to 1. Okay, I think Zoback says in the book that uh, there's a guy Jaeger who was a, one of the most famous sort of rock mechanicians ever. He had he, Zoback quotes him as saying something like, you know, "There's only two things you need to know about friction. The first thing is it's always 0.6, and the second thing is it'll make a monkey out of you." And what he meant was, you know, essentially, if you don't know any different, just use 0.6 because it's almost always 0.6 until you need it to be, and then it'll be something else, you know. So, you know, in this class, we'll, we'll you know, if I don't give you a value for friction, just use 0.6. I try to always give you a value, but if for some reason I don't, just use 0.6. It's sort of a rule of thumb. So then, with my comment regarding pore pressure, uh, we're, we're going to talk more about induced seismicity later in the class when we talk about hydraulic fracturing. Um, you know, induced seismicity is kind of a fancy word that petroleum engineers made up to disguise another word, right? What's the other word? Earthquake, right? So everybody knows that it's been pretty common uh, in the news lately about the earthquake activity, specifically in Oklahoma, right? Um, and in Oklahoma, it's due to the fact that there's a high density lo location of injection wells uh, where they've been continuously injecting wastewater from hydraulic fracture operations for a long time, and it's and it's you know they're, they're sort of a localized region, and it's causing the earthquakes, of course. But this isn't new. Uh, in fact, um, you know if you look at the um, x-axis here, I mean this is dates in the 60s, and so this is a uh, this was in, in Colorado uh, at, a, at a military facility where they were in injecting fluid, and they were measuring the seismic activity. So up here, they were injecting fluid at a constant rate, so the, the, the pressure is going up and down. But over several years, and you see there appears to be some correlation with the amount of seismic activity or number of earthquakes, essentially, uh, and, the, and, the, and the pressure. So when the pressure got large, high, you'd see an increase in earthquake activity. Uh, and then certainly here in 65, that, that seemed to be the case. So uh, this, this is not something that's new or necessarily associated with the shell revolution and hydraulic fracturing. This is, you know, we've known about this for a, for a long time. This was at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal. So we've known about this for some time. And, you know, this is sort of the motivation for trying to figure out these types of problems, right? Is that, we, you know, we want to understand so that we can prevent this from happening. We certainly don't want this to occur on, on purpose, right? Because, you know, while the majority, the vast majority of those earthquakes being caused by hydraulic fracture, or, you know, again, it's not hydraulic fracturing, but rather the wastewater operations associated with hydraulic fracture, you know, the vast majority of those are really, really small. You know, something like, uh, you know, something that you can't feel. Mo most of them are, you can't feel, right? Um, but, you know, in terms of those ones in Oklahoma, they, they can feel them, and they're shaking people's houses. And they're, again, they're small. They're not likely to ever do any damage. But, you know, if it's your house that's shaken, there's no such thing as a small earthquake, right? And so, you know, we really want to prevent this. And this is the motivation for studying this type of problems and why you need to know how to do this fault resolution and understand how pore pressure plays a role in all this, okay? Uh, all right, so 